It's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Ron Howard. Ron directs the Decision Analysis Program at Stanford University in the Department of Management, Science, and Engineering. In 1964, Ron defined the area of decision analysis and has been involved with applications of decision analysis across a broad spectrum, including interesting things like seeding hurricanes and isolating nuclear waste. Ron is also the director of the Decisions and Ethics Center at Stanford and co-authored Ethics for the Real World with Clint Corbett. I asked Ron to pull together topics that we've already covered, frame and values, add in creative alternatives, which is our current topic, and bring in ethics to boot. I think that Ron is up to the challenge. Let's hear what he had to say. Well, I'm sure the people who are attending this course have learned a lot about decision-making already. And it's certainly true that many decisions that we make are not particularly ethical, ethically sensitive, like perhaps what car you're going to buy or, or uh, how you should treat uh, a broken leg or something like that. But there are decisions that you make that have this nature that you have to think about what is your ethical stance in making those decisions. And those are the ones I think we're going to be focusing on today. So uh, that means in terms of the framing of the decision, perhaps one of the checkoff uh, elements you ought to have is whether this is an ethically sensitive decision you're making. And since uh, most of these decisions that we make in response to a situation have to be made pretty quickly, you may not have a, a lot of time to think about what the, the ethically correct thing to do is. You better be doing some uh, pre, pre preparation, let's call it, in, in uh, uh, formulating decisions to say, what are ethically sensitive decisions? So I know right away that I should uh, think carefully about them in that dimension and not just as a, a decision that depends on my general preferences and values. Ethically sensitive decisions tend to be those that that affect primarily other people in your relationship with them. Uh, so, and, and the three dimensions of them that seem to be uh, uh, most important are those of physically harming other people in some way uh, or depriving them of their property, stealing. The, the one that seems to be of both, decisions that seem to be most of concern to people in the class are those involving uh, uh, truth telling. When do you tell the truth? Should you always tell the truth? And so forth. And these range from very simple social situations like how do I look in this dress, which uh, often requires people to say, think to say something that, that is not perhaps their honest feeling at that time, to all the ones like uh, this, we have a person who looks terminally ill and may well die very soon. Uh, and now the question is, do you if the person asks, how am I doing, don't you forthright with that person and tell them uh, to the best of your ability what you, you're uncertain about how long they might actually continue to live. Now, every time we've consulted with a professional in this kind of area, they've said it's best to tell the truth. Uh, in other words, they know that they are not well. They're not asking this out of some uh, uh, you know, general belief that they're going to live forever. Uh, and they have many, oftentimes many things they would like to do, like mend their relationships with people in their lives, their relatives that may not have, have gone as well as they would, and this is their chance to fix it, or more, uh, uh, more practical matters like arranging their finances. So I've never heard anyone who's really dealt with, with the terminally ill say anything other than just tell the truth. But the truth has to be, deciding you're going to tell the truth is one thing, Determining what the truth is is also very important. You have to say, well, what is the real truth here? Not, not simply uh, uh, a statement like you got six months to live, because in fact, nobody could make that statement. No doctor could. But a more accurate one might be, okay, well, you know, people in your situation, uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, live a, a few months, sometimes uh, years, uh, and we really don't know why one does and the other one doesn't. And that's, if that's the doctor's true belief, then that's what the doctor should say. One of the things that I think is particularly um, powerful 
is how you put the frame on relationships and the ability to actually deepen a relationship even when it feels like you may be facing a dilemma that yep. is, is on both sides a, a loss. Yes, well just think about any, any statements that you exchange in a conversation and that, that's communication. And if you are going to have things in your communication that are not accurate, uh, then you're, you're, you're losing the opportunity to deepen that conversation. Why would you want people in your life that are like these false dashboards? If, if, why do you not want accurate information? You know, it's a little bit like training wheels on bicycles. If you have training wheels on bicycles, you're never really going to learn to ride a bicycle until you take the training wheels off. So you might as well begin with the fact that, yeah, you, you, if you're going to ride a bicycle and learn how to ride it, certainly that was when I was a kid, uh, you, you, you're, my, in my case, my father was holding on to the carrier of the bike and, and I was riding along, I mean, doing my best, looking around to make sure he's still there. And one day, uh, went to, well, not one day, one moment, I looked back and he wasn't there, so I fell off. But I knew how to ride a bicycle. Now, if the training wheels had been there, I wouldn't have learned. So just telling the truth is the way to give accurate feedback to everybody in every situation, every relationship that you have. Well, there's two, <clears throat> two major ways to think about ethics. One is my ethics de is determined by what I do. And the other is my ethics is determined by the results of what I do. So the, the first one called action-based ethics, and the other is, is called uh, consequence-based ethics. So the, the first case you say, well, there, there are some things that I just don't do, like lie, for example, or steal, or hurt people, hurt innocent people. And then I don't do that no matter, no matter what the consequences are. And this is the idea of action-based ethics. In the other case, you say, well, anything is open to me. I have all the alternatives you could imagine, and I'll just look and see what happens or what I think is likely to happen with each of these, and then choose whatever, whatever uh, alternative gives me the best combination of probabilities of, of consequences. Now, the irony is that decision analysis seems best suited to consequence-based ethics, because then, then it's just like, the different prospects in your future, uh, you say, well, I just rank them and then I determine what to do. Whereas if you're action-based, you say, there's some things I just don't do, like lie, steal, <laughs> hurt people. And up at the beginning of your tree, and I'm sure you've talked all about this, you take out those alternatives. And uh, you know some of, the, some of the, the deepest ethical beliefs are those that are essentially action-based. There's just some things you won't do. So, in fact, the frame itself determines whether or not some alternatives are on the table. Yeah, you know, I, I think the, the ethical considerations are beyond any frame. In other words, the frame is for a particular decision situation. But I don't, when I, when I mentioned my ethic about uh, tell the truth, that's not, let me see what this decision is and I'll decide whether to tell the truth. That's in general. In other words, it, I tell the truth on Mondays, on Tuesdays, on Wednesdays, in February, and every year, and that's my intention. Now, I may have to work hard to figure out what my truth is, but I'm always going to tell it, because I want to be you know, a person who, when he says something, people should uh, believe that that's what I mean and not uh, have some other devious plan for how they're supposed to interpret it. So for me, this is beyond the preferences, values, and all of that but about you. When you take that position about yeah. your own personal ethics, yeah. it makes a lot of things simpler in terms of many alternatives don't even come into don't question, come and some decisions right. don't right. come into question. Very clarifying, very clarifying. And you know, this applies to all the variants of stealing, like cheating, uh, sending the wrong bill to the client, you know, they just never come up once you're telling the truth. The hard part is figuring out what the real truth is in some situ situations, but yeah. You mentioned three strategies when there's one of these situations that comes up. Um, comply, elevate, and transform. Well, that's in the book, yes. 
Complying means you just go along, and if it's not ethically sensitive, in other words, if people say, you know, you've got to take off your shoes to get on the airplane, uh, maybe that's offensive to you, but you may ask, ah, screw it, you know, I'm just going to do it anyway. Uh, so that's complying. Right? But you wouldn't want to comply if it's an ethically sensitive situation. Okay, I don't, I mean, that, that would be a violation of the ethics I mentioned if they said, well, you know, you've got to steal this no matter what, or you've got to hurt this person no matter what, or, or lie no matter what. I just wouldn't do it. Uh, but but that, that was the first one of go along, and then you can, you can find new alternatives perhaps to get around it, uh, the second thing. Or you may be able to elevate it to an even higher problem, a higher, higher domain where this, you, this, uh, you see it in a completely different way. Uh, this is like the, uh, the story of the, uh, the, the Buddha who uh, met, went uh, to a place where there was a, uh, a little town and they said, well, look out because the, you know, up on the mountainside there's a murderer who's killed a thousand people. And you know, he better get, don't go anywhere near there. But Buddha, of course, said, I think I'll have to check this out. And I went up and, and uh, uh, met the murderer. Uh, and the murderer had this giant axe, really big guy, giant axe. And uh, the guy says, hey, I'm going to kill you. He says, okay, but would you grant me one request first? Yeah, but you're going to die. Okay, you see that big branch up on the tree? Uh, please cut that off with your axe in one blow. Murderer says, no problem and wax it right off. And Buddha said, great, now put it on again. And the murderer became enlightened in a monk. And that's transforming. Because this person was playing the best game he knew, which was murdering people. And Buddha showed him that there was a much higher game that he couldn't play at all. And at that point, there was no point in playing, no reason to continue his previous existence, and, and uh, he transformed himself. Now, those are rare. It takes people like Buddha, you know, famous religious figures, to be able to do that. It'd be great if we could all do it in these moments, but, but that's the ultimate elevation. Is there some sort of suggestion that you would give to people for how to be centered in that kind of a... Of a position in order to respond in the moment as opposed to react? Well, I think this is like many things in life. You don't suddenly become, let's say, ethically aware uh, all of a sudden, unless you're this poor, poor murderer. Uh, usually you have to realize that this is a way you want to be throughout your life in every setting, personal, you know, public, and so forth. Because then when you're used to being that way, when these, the idea of acting unethically uh, just wouldn't even occur to you, uh, then you don't have any, any uh, concerns. For example, when I was a student uh, in college, the idea of attempting to bribe a teacher to get a better grade could never even occurred to me. This was not an alternative. It was unthinkable. And once we make unethical actions unthinkable, then we've solved the problem right away. That's the transcendence. It's not just I considered uh, murdering this person and didn't, but murdering someone? I mean, can you imagine Gandhi saying, hmm, shall I murder this person? It's unthinkable for someone like that. That's another strategy that you put forward. Absolutely. Is to think it's of what somebody that you really admire would do in a certain yes, situation. Yes, and you know, the unexamined life is not worth living. So examine your ethical stance in life very early because there's some of the great sadness comes from when you realize much later that you didn't act ethically in the past and now there's nothing you can do about it. Um, why is it that you feel that people should learn about um, making better decisions? A good decision never becomes bad and a bad decision never becomes good. So why wouldn't you always want to make good decisions? If you knew how, and that's what this course is about. <laughs>